Morning, glory, America. Bonjour, hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Overnight, cracks began to form in the wall of the 20s. The 200 temperatures rise. The 200 who are supporting Kevin McCarthy are getting angrier and angrier. I'm going to play for you the press conference that was held yesterday by about 20. It might have been 21. It might have been 19. I couldn't tell. People went and came of the military veterans supporting McCarthy, and they are firm. They are not backing up an inch. There is no one in Team McCarthy actually backing up. The 200 is not going to split. The 20, though, began to give themselves some wiggle room. The sane ones did, like Chip Roy and Brian Donalds. They are, um, Byron Donalds, they are hurting themselves. They put themselves on fire, and they know it. And now the Club for Growth has endorsed Kevin. Donald Trump has endorsed Kevin. And so the 20 are increasingly look like the Crank Caucus. And I really just think it's the Gates gang. Gates is the face of it. Smart people like Chip Roy know that's terrible for a career. Many of these 20 have blown their re-election already. Will they come out of the pit of despair today? I don't know. But let's start with the press conference, the military veterans yesterday, uh, part one. And if you're watching on the Salem News Channel, it's a lot better if you can see these brave warriors. Uh, but if you can't, just listen to them. Let's play cut number one. They are walking in, by the way. I just gather on them. Pack it down. Listen, hey, thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have here a group of combat veterans. Uh, all of whom have served uh, this great nation uh, overseas, in combat, in the various branches, and have decided to continue their service uh, in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, they all know what it means to be on a team. They know what it means to sacrifice. They know that there are more men and women overseas right now putting their lives on the line for this republic than the entire British, Canadian, and Australian military combined. Uh, and they know what it means to be worthy and conduct themselves in a way that is worthy of the sacrifices for the men and women we couldn't bring home or who came home literally missing limbs uh, and forever altered upstairs. So uh, I'm going to hand off in just a moment. But before I do, to get their perspective on what this all means to us, why they ran, and what's going on in the last few days. But before I do, I just want to take a minute to read what our adversaries are saying. Uh, in North Korea, in Iran, in Venezuela, in Cuba, authoritarian regimes all over the world are pointing to what's going on in the House of Representatives and saying, look at the messiness of democracy. Look at how it doesn't work, how it can't function, and in contrast to their authoritarian regimes. Uh, and just a couple of quotes from Chinese state media, from the Global Times. Uh, the events are chaotic, phenomena of spread and aggravation of the disease of the U.S. political system. What happened in the highest hall of U.S. democracy is not a simple farce, but a political thriller with huge destructiveness and a wide-ranging and far-reaching impact. Faced with the political chaos in the U.S., there is a sharp question whether the political class of the country is able to govern and whether the internal conflicts and contradictions of one of the major political parties contaminate the entire system. Looks, I think my colleagues would join me in that this is unacceptable. Some points have been made, concessions have been made, and now is time to move on, to move forward, and to govern as the Amer in the, the way the American people elect us to do. And I will hand off to one of our newest colleagues, former Navy SEAL, Representative Van Orden, Representative-elect Van Orden. Representative-elect, yes. for a reason. All right. I am not a member of Congress yet, and as a matter of fact, there is no Congress right now, because we're at an impasse. So you're looking at 291 years of military service myself including everybody behind me. I'll say that again, 291 years of collective military service. Combat deployments, we've spent years and years away from our home serving our nation proudly. I'm 53 years old. I've had 50 of my friends killed in training and combat 
since 9-11. And we must absolutely understand the gravity of what we're talking about. We are here to serve the American people. We all put a uniform on before. Well, this is my uniform now. And I plan on serving the people of the United States of America. The people standing behind me have regularly, consistently, over decades, proven that they're willing to put something greater than themselves above themselves. It's service over self. I'm incredibly proud to be a member of this august body. And I want to make sure that everybody out there understands what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to make sure that we can do the people's will. And a minority of our party has decided that they want to continue with this obstructionism, and it's actually becoming detrimental to our nation. And I will not stand for that. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, I'll turn it over to Representative Dan Crenshaw. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor to be joined by uh, my fellow veterans, served abroad, served this country. And um, I suppose I would say a few things uh, about service and why we serve. We all served in different ways, but we mostly served for the same reason, so that we would take the fight to the enemy, and the enemy would not no longer take the fight to the American people. We had purpose. We had mission. That was our mission. We have mission up here. Some people have different priorities. Some people want to cut spending. Some people want to fix our, our mandatory spending problems. Some of us want to fix the border, deal with the Mexican drug cartels that are murdering uh, tens of thousands of Americans a year by poisoning them with fentanyl. There's a lot of missions that we have up here. I don't think that the American people care about any of these so-called missions happening this week. Rules changes, who gets more power, who gets on what committee. I can't think of one American who gives a damn about any of that. They care about the mission. And the conservative agenda is one that will accomplish the mission for the American people the best. But we can't start that agenda until we start governing. That's why we're up here, because we care about mission, we care about service, and we care about the American people, and we care about getting things done. And I'm honored to be with this group to talk about just that. Thank you very much. And... Oh, man, the whole eyesight thing. I would like to introduce Representative Bost, that, um, my colleague. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Mike Bost, um, let me first off by saying I am honored to stand up here with all of these combat veterans. I am not a combat veteran. I'm a veteran that served, did not serve in combat. But I am the ranking member, and our hopes is to be chairman of the VA committee. So without a speaker in place, let's put this in perspective. We cannot organize or conduct or oversight. We cannot hold Biden VA accountable. We cannot do our jobs to ensure veterans are getting the care and benefit that they, they are due. Without a speaker, our committee can't conduct vital, important oversight of the implementation of the PACT Act, which we passed this last year. Remember, this bill is the largest expansion of health care benefits to over 3.5 million veterans. And we must be, be watching closely to make sure vet, veterans are getting the care and benefits they've earned. Hold hey, let's pause hand. it there. We'll come back to more of the veterans. I just thought it was so powerful. They just stood up one after the other. And they're like, they're 20 or two or 23 of them. They're not all in the shot if you're watching on the Salem News Channel. But they're there because they are hit, They are ticked off. In fact, uh, uh, my friend uh, Guy Benson hosted Dan Crenshaw, and he really let go. Let's just play very quickly cut number 19, then I'll do the market report. Get another scalp and another scalp, whether it's whether it's Boehner or Paul Ryan or then McCarthy, Scalise would just be next and we all know it. We just can't allow that to happen. That's why those of us are saying, like, look, you pushed us into this corner, so now we're now we're saying we won't vote for anyone but McCarthy. That's why we're saying it, because we cannot let the terrorists win. That's Nobody but McCarthy. No, we can't let the terrorists win got a lot of attention. What he meant is you never give in to hostage takers. Welcome back, America. Political paralysis is never pretty. The people I think most acquainted with it are Israelis who have suffered through it for five years until the new government got seated. Michael Oren is joining us. He's the former Israeli ambassador to the United States. He's also the former deputy prime minister. He is abroad now. Michael, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm curious, you know, you were an American before you became an Israeli. We've never had a situation in my lifetime where the House didn't organize on the first day. Uh, this is really weird. What do you think? And what does it, what lessons ought Americans to know about when a small group holds 
an entire caucus hostage? Uh, it, 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 can, it can last more than a few days. I mean, you've had a week of this now with the, you know, the struggle over the Speaker of the House. We've had the government, not just the Speaker of our House, but of the entire government for years. I mean, the big issue this week um, in Israel, Hugh, is, is not what's happening in, in, in the Congress, but what's happening on the Temple Mount. Um, and that has been a huge issue. Um, we have our new Minister of Internal Security visiting the Temple Mount, Itamar ben Veer. Uh, and it's now caused a Security Council resolution, confrontations around the world, and, and great divisions within Israeli society. Let, let me ask you something. Um, I, I just want to say his name right. Ben, is it Veer or Gavir? It's Gavir. Gavir. There's no All right, so I thought he made a pledge to Netanyahu not to do that. No, he said he wouldn't do it with a big group. You know, here's the issue. Let, let me, I've been on the, I've been on Israeli media all week about this, so, so let me let me clarify a few things. Uh, a visit by any Israeli a minister or simple citizen is no violation of the status quo agreement on the sat on the, on the Temple Mount, uh, according to the Supreme Court of Israel. There is a ruling saying that Jews should not pray in organized fashion on the Temple Mount in order to not precipitate a riot or violence. But there's no question about the right of Jews to pray in our holiest site. I mean, can you imagine the United States saying Jews couldn't pray in New York or Jews couldn't pray in a set place in California? No one can say that Jews can't pray anywhere, but certainly not in our holiest site. Uh, the, so there's no question of the right. The question is, what would be the price of sort of realizing the right? And could there be violence? Could there be uh, condemnations of the Security Council? Could that be used as a basis of blockades and sanctions against us? Uh, those are serious questions. If anybody violates the status quo on the Temple Mount, it is the Palestinians, and they do it in a serial manner. They have excavated beneath the Temple Mount. They have ruined the relics of the first temple. And by the way, here's an interesting fact which almost nobody knows, Hugh, so here I'm going to give it to you. There is one holy place in Jerusalem, not the Western Wall, not the Holy Sepulchre, which denies access to members of other faiths. If you're a Jew... You're a Christian, you cannot go to the, to the Dome of the Rock. You're a Christian, you can go to the Western Wall. If you're a Jew, you can go in the Holy Sepulchre. I've done it many, many times. But I cannot go into the Dome of the Rock because I'm Jewish. If anybody's discriminating against anybody, it's the Palestinians. So I, I just don't, I, I, I followed the news, and I saw that, that the uh, Attorney General is throwing up her arms about Ben Gavir. <laughs> What is the deal with the Attorney General? In the United States, the Attorney General is a political appointee. Is this um, Attorney General, she is, I can't remember her name, is she going to last in this job? Because it seems to me your AG cannot be against the government for political reasons, and she appears to be. Well, this is the whole argument. Um, the, the AG is independent in our country. He's like, he's like a state controller, or she is a state controller, uh, for legal matters. And you know, many people in Israel, including this government, would like to see the Attorney General be appointed as the Attorney General is in the United States. Um, and the pushback will be, okay, there's no, you know, wh where is the supervision? Where is the objective? It's, it's roughly analogous to what's going on between the Knesset and, and the Supreme Court. Um, you know, who is actually going to be the sovereign? Who's going to have the final stay? It's not just that there's a debate over the uh, Attorney General, but each minister has a, uh, a legal advisor who ostensibly is independent and not appointed by that minister. And the current government wants these advisors to be appointed by the ministers. Yeah, and what's interesting to me is that that makes perfect sense. And it's not part of the basic law, is it, that the attorney general be appointed by, uh, as a nonpartisan permit? Is that in the basic law? It is in law. But not the basic law, right? Law. I don't know if it's what, no, it's not a basic law, but it's certainly uh, okay. a law. So and it's just a uh, law, so it can be changed by the majority. I mean, I, I what I see happening on the left in, in Israel, Michael, is what I see happening on the left in the New York Times and other places in the United States, which is they're for democracy when it goes their way and they're against it when it doesn't. Yeah, and the attack on the, on the Supreme Court, you know, the criticism of the Supreme Court in the United States is from the left. The attack on the Supreme Court in Israel is from the right, and, and for the same reason. And it has to do with the outlook of the judges. So the judges in the United States are, are, you know, are appointed by the president, ratified by the Senate, 
But in Israel, our judges are pretty much appointed by existing gu- judges, which means, and I've said this several times in the program, our judges, in terms of their worldview, are, are sitting in place around ni- circa 1990. Yeah. But the Knesset has moved on. The Knesset has moved on right. The country has and moved on. in lies the tension. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think if people are going to be small D Democrats, they got to live with the election results. And I said that from the night that Trump lost to today, and I continue to say it about every country in the world that wants to be a democracy. You live with the results when you lose. Michael Oren, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be right back. More on the 200 versus the 20. Welcome back, America. Senator Jim Talent, retired, was a member of the House. Good morning, Senator Talent. How are you? I am fine, you. These are interesting times. Uh, I think uh, Jim Banks, your friend and mine, was on yeah. just now on Fox and Friends. I want to play a clip and get you to react to it a few times. Clip number one. Brian, this reminds me of the ancient philosopher Mick Jagger, who said you can't always get what you want. But if you try, sometimes you get what you need. And I think in this case, we've got what we need. It's time to move on, roll up our sleeves and get to work. There have been a lot of concessions, discussions that went late into the night last week, last night with the holdouts and uh, Leader McCarthy and others uh, to to give them uh, more seats at the table on committees, uh, change some of the rules. At this point, the rules that have been negotiated are really good to empower rank and file members and take power away from the hands of just one or two people in leadership. And, And that's good for the institution. It's good for the party. It's time to move forward, unify, and we've got to get back to work. So, Jim Talon, how do you uh, how do you hear that? What's that what's that mean to you? What that means to me is that they are doing what I figured they would do, which is peel off the Chip Roy faction, gain some momentum and then wear down uh, those who are most irreconcilable. And you, the irony of all this is that when you weaken the majority leadership structurally in a legislative body, you know, who you empower, you empower the minority and the people in your own party who are most likely to vote with the minority most often, which is, of course, the people that the hardliners think of as the squishes, okay? So if you're a hardliner, what you want to do is support the leadership generally, but anticipate where you don't trust them and use carrots and sticks to get them to do what you want on those issues. Let me play one more bit of Jim Banks for you, Jim Talent. Here's Jim Banks moments ago. Next cut, Jacob. Is it stuck? Well, we're going to have another vote at noon, and I I think you're going to see some progress. I I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. So if that happens, hopefully that progress snowballs and and members who are holding out feel pressure in their districts or from others to unify with the party and do the right thing and elect a speaker. Right there, uh, Jim Talent, uh, overnight Scott Perry uh, had to read a column by Selena Zito, who was in his district, and he won with an 8% margin, comfortable. But boy, are people mad at him. Do, they, do you think the 20 understand what they're doing to their reelections? Uh, I'm not sure you, because I think they may be hearing from a group of people who want them to do this or are just angry and want them to do something. But they have to understand, OK, that nobody in your base likes it when it looks like you are just bumbling around. In other words, when you do something like this and you don't get anything productive about it, because people want you to win and to be effective. So yes, I agree with you. I think this is a lot more dangerous for them politically than it is helpful. Uh, At the same time, they're dug into this you. So we have to find a way for them to get out from under. I know they need a ladder or they need a fire extinguisher. And maybe Chip Roy went in there with that in mind. Now I am, uh, I start in the morning beating up on the 20. Mark Levin comes along. Dana Loesch comes along. Sean Hannity ends the night beating up on the 20. Uh, who is the base they think they're hearing from? I mean, I define the base as have you voted for your Republican five times in, you know, for over a period of 10 years? How do you define the base? Yeah, well, I think actually the base is much more united than many people in Washington think they are because they all want basically the same thing. And you've talked about it. <clears throat> they want the investigations to go forward. They want a strong anti-China policy. They want a strong border policy. They want a a pro-energy production policy. And these are all the things the House will do. Now, there are some issues like budgeting and omnibus. I mean, Chip Roy is not wrong to be worried about that issue. But But I think weakening the leadership structurally will make it more difficult for him to get what he wants. I, I think you're right. 
I think you're, uh, they I do not understand they're, they're taking cards out of Kevin McCarthy's hands for when those negotiations happen. Exactly right. And, and the, it's just a fact that the leadership will do, uses its power most of the time to control the people in the party who are most likely to vote with the Democrats. And that's not Chip Roy and Matt Gates. OK, now, you know, you don't like to talk. Kevin McCarthy doesn't like to talk about these things because a nobody's interested and B, it looks like typical Washington stuff. But I was a leader in, in the 1980s in the Missouri legislature for four years. I was a Republican leader. And the powers that I had, I had to use most of the time against the same set of people who were the people who were the most moderate. Because the Republican agenda, as we can see, is going to be pretty conservative most of the time. So, look, I understand their anger. I do. But I, and I said this in the column I wrote. You were nice enough to tweet it out. They're going about it the wrong way. Uh, are you optimistic that this is over by Monday or it's going to take a month? Because no, the, the McCarthy people aren't leaving, despite the legacy media. They're, they're rock solid. They're Gibraltar Republicans. You know, I don't know, because the last time this happened was 1855. And I'm old, but I wasn't alive then. So You and me <laughs> both. I, yeah, I think <clears throat> you, you and I have been around a while, but not that long. So, I, look, I, yeah, I think... They're going to figure this out, and I am then hopeful that everything will get organized and they'll get going, and then we'll start confronting the real challenges, which is what you do on all these issues and how you are effective in dealing with the, with the opponents who, let's not remember, the political opponents are actually the Democrats. Not yeah, the you, would, you would forget that. Follow Jim Talent at Jim Talent on Twitter. He's the real deal. He's the real base, America, by the way. He's also a reasonable guy, and we love him. Thank you, Jim. We'll be right back. Hour number three, straight ahead. America, bonjour. Hi, Canada. You're here live from Studio West. I fled the East, and we are in the middle of a torrential downpour. That's what happens. Brett Baer is still inside the Beltway and bringing us up to date on what he has heard overnight about the battle to become Speaker by Kevin McCarthy. Good morning, Brett. Thank you for hosting me last night. What have you heard overnight? Uh, here in progress. Uh, for the McCarthy camp and hearing uh, that they're at about peeling, you know, 10 off, uh, whether they vote present or not is, is interesting, you know, because you've got to do the math. It's <laughs> once you start getting people voting present, then as you know, the overall number goes down, the magic number that you have to hit goes down, but Hakeem Jeffries is obviously hitting 212 each time. So they've got to figure out how to get McCarthy to 213. Uh, but bottom line, as I heard overnight and this morning, progress uh, from the McCarthy folks. Now, you know, Brad, I love this story coming up because it doesn't, it means I don't have to talk about Georgia football with you. But I want to recognize <laughs> this. This son of Georgia, this Marist High School graduate is being very kind. He has not taunted me, even though I have Buckeye Brutus behind me on my bookshelf. <laughs> uh, Brad, let me play a little bit of what Jim Banks told your colleagues on Fox and Friends this morning. Cut number two of Jim Banks. Well, we're going to have another vote at noon, and I, I think you're going to see some progress. I, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. So if that happens, hopefully that progress snowballs. Balls and, and members who are holding out feel pressure in their districts or from others to unify with the party and do the right thing and elect a speaker so that we can work on the issues that matters. I think uh, at noon, you I, I, Let's I stop don't there. So, Brett, it looks like it's not blinking. I think uh, the smart guy, Chip Roy, got some concessions on Rules Committee. So now there's a bridge off the island. If you stay on the island, what do you think is going to happen to the 10 or, or, or so who stay on the island and the mutiny continues? Well, I think there'll be pressure building from, you know, listen, they're going to have diehards at their, their base saying, you know, you go, you're fighting for us. But when it diminishes and the number is 8 to 10, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure from home. Uh, hey, we got to get going here. Uh, we look bad and it's you got to get moving to actually doing things that you promised us we would do. I think, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword, Hugh, as we talked about last night. Uh, McCarthy has given up the ranch here. And uh, when you get to that point with these folks who have demonstrated their ability to stand up and throw things into the, the wheel and stop the motion, um, they're going to be given key committee positions and uh, rules committee positions. And the question is, whether that takes away his ability to really legislate. Um, you, you know, there are two members with whom I don't think any common cause will be made, Matt Gates and uh, Bob Good. 
And those two are just in a world by themselves. Everybody else at some time in their life has been a realistic person. Andy Biggs ran the Arizona Senate, for goodness sakes. He knows what it's like. So I, I'm curious, how long will this story linger and how much damage do you think it's done to the Republican agenda? I think it will. they will bounce back. They'll start doing things that people, Republicans, want to see. Uh, but remember, with slim majorities, they're just not going to have a lot of success, and obviously with the Democratic Senate. I think what has happened in a way is good in that you bring up the question of spending and how Washington works. What has been bad is that by doing that, they've tarred uh, Kevin McCarthy and even, by extension, Donald Trump, uh, saying that they're part of the swamp, uh, which was really quite something to watch. Yeah, Victoria Sparts, a uh, congresswoman from Indiana, was thinking about challenging Jim Banks, whose, whose clips we've been playing. Uh, and, and Jim Banks is the prohibitive front runner. And she decided to vote present after Donald Trump uh, urged everyone to get behind. I, I don't understand what possible advantage other than, and you were, you were uh, kind enough not to mention this last night because we can't read people's minds, but some members of Congress want to become you, Brett or they want to become me. They want to become on the radio or they want to be on the television. I don't think this is a good strategy to advance that sort of a career. Do you? Uh, I I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> but listen, I worked for Kinziger on CNN. So It did. You know, that was CNN officially declaring that they're out of the running for the GOP debates. <laughs> <laughs> that was my reaction. Oh, they don't <laughs> right. want the debates. Because yeah, exactly. it's just kind of, oh. So um, let, let's move forward and, and talk a little bit about McCarthy. Uh, obviously dinged up, but people have been dinged up before. And McCarthy is resilient. You've spent a lot of time with him. I've spent a lot of time with him. He's also not said an angry word in public, to my knowledge. Am I wrong about that? I don't think so. I haven't seen it. I know in private it's reported that he's been quite angry and vocal and um and loud, but uh, I agree with you in public. It's, it's another thing. And I also agree with you. He's been dinged up before. I mean, remember 2015 and uh, he's, he's pretty resilient. Again, the question is, you know, with this public display, how much is he going to be able to herd the cats? And I don't think it's going to be pretty uh, the process on the Republican side in the house, uh, but it's also going to be uh you know, a stalemate. They're not going to be able to, to get a lot done unless they fully negotiate with Democrats. And maybe that's something he's willing to do. First thing he does, I think, is is dispatch Jordan and judiciary to the border. And Mike Gallagher stands up the China committee and the oversight gets going. But I also think he holds some big fundraisers and amasses a war chest. And and everybody notices. I mean, the speaker raises money, Brett. You're the speaker of the House of Representatives. That, yeah. that, to me, is the way he, he bounces back quickly, is by filling up I, the gas tank. I agree. I agree with that. I do think that there is some exhaustion in the Republican donor ranks. And after this display, there's a lot of frustration. So the wallets may not be as open as they have been before. Um, that said, I agree with you. I think the border is number one uh, position for them. And I think those hearings on the border will be something that he does. He's talked about it. Um, and I think spending... You know, on the big picture, uh, I think Ukraine funding, you know, for all that is said, is going to be on the table for uh, debate. And uh, that's a lot of the, the 20 here. That's what they want to talk about. Last question, Brett Baer. Last night you brought up uh, Joe Biden is going to the border. My answer to you was that's because he has to. Why do you think he's doing it? Well, I think he does have to. When you have Gavin Newsom going to the border saying we as a party need to take this seriously, and uh, you have other Democrats uh, raising alarm bells. I think that that is something he has to do. Um, it's also getting untenable down there. You're losing whole cities uh, to an influx that has to be stopped. And, um, you know, I think the Title 42 thing is one aspect of it. But the other part is this attack that we're taking from fentanyl. I mean, it is an attack on our nation. And uh, for him to just get it with a speech today and a visit next week, a little late, but they know how important political. You know, that's interesting, Brent. I, I hadn't thought about it in those terms before. Whenever there's a disaster in the United States, the president shows up, whether it's Sandy Hook, whether it is uh, Hurricane Katrina or Ian, they always show There's a disaster at the border. You're, you're absolutely right. He's doing disaster comforting when he goes down there. But 
the question will arise why he hadn't been there before. And do you think he'll have to go more than once? I think it'll be, you know, one time shows his face and then uh, they try to do uh, some executive actions. You know, uh, Quayar suggested to me last week, week before, that there were some things in the works that they thought that they could change executive action wise. I don't know why they haven't done it up until now. Uh, I think that the political onus before the election was that it was such a bad issue for them that they just ignored it. And it's not ignorable anymore. Uh, Brett Bear, we're going to be watching tonight. You started a new podcast, by the way, which was news to me last night on the set. Where do people find that? Yeah, and so foxnewspodcast.com, or actually wherever you download podcasts, Spotify, uh, wherever. And it's called the Brett Bear Podcast. And under there, you can find Common Ground, which is the left and right or different perspectives, uh, and also the All-Star Panel Podcast. So both of those are in one spot. Brett Bear, always good to talk to you, my friend. Thank you, and and go Buckeyes. We'll get you next time. Uh, <laughs> All right, I didn't even mention it to you. I know you you are the gentleman's gentleman on television. People <laughs> ask me why I do special report because he doesn't gig me when when I'm already bleeding. He doesn't come step on the on the wound. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Brett Bear. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. I'm joined by Jim Garrity, the indispensable. You read Jim in the Washington Post. You read him in the National Review. You should be getting the morning jolt every day. And I hope to make him a weekly cap. I mean, guest on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Uh, I'm falling into hostage talk because of the 20. Good morning, Garrity, the indispensable. <laughs> what, is, what do you hear? Are you as optimistic as Jim Banks that some of the uh, 20 are going to get let off the island by Chip Roy this morning at noon? I think it would be good to see that happen. Um, I don't. I, you recognize that to get to 218, he needs all of them except you know four, and it sounds like at least five of them. You know the Gates, the Boberts, the, the usual that they're the you know the diehards of the diehards, and that they're not interested. You know, look. I think it's safe to say that you know that core group is has an appetite for conflict for the sake of conflict. Uh, their brand is chaos. So I, you know, could could Chip Roy bring over a bunch? Yes, I I think that's you know the likely you know beginning of the end of this. Although nobody knows exactly when it's going to happen, um, but it just I still think I, I don't know if that gets him to two eighteen, and that's you know this is a rather infuriating spectacle. I don't think it speaks terribly well of Kevin McCarthy that his attitude has been well. I'll just wait. You know we're going to keep doing this until you guys quit. Because the attitude of the 20 is, we're going to keep doing this till you quit. And it's like, you know, it's like watching a game of chicken where they keep crashing into each other and then, you know, lining up to do it all over again. All right, here's Jim Banks this morning on Fox and Friends. Play the second cut of Jim Banks. Well, we're going to have another vote at noon, and I, I think you're going to see some progress. I, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. So if that happens, hopefully that progress snowballs and, and members who are holding out feel pressure in their districts or from others to unify with the party and do the right thing and elect a speaker so that we can work on the issues that matters. I think at noon, you I, I stop I, I there and go to cut number at four. noon that we're going to elect a speaker, but I do expect. Yeah, th last night, uh, Chip Roy, a, a number of others engaging in serious conversations with Kevin McCarthy and others about what it would take to bring them back to the table. And I, as I understand it from from Chip Roy uh, and that group, that there there was progress made, that the, that those concessions that they were looking for are being made to on the on the motion to vacate from five back to one, where it's historically been on uh, giving uh, some of the, the the more conservative members of right. the table seats on the powerful rules committee, which I'm. I'm All right, Joe, Jim Garrity, about. that was the secret, right? Yesterday they were talking about adding three members to the steering committee, but now they're adding members to the rules committee. And the same mutineers will take the win and grow in esteem. Like Chip Roy is pretty widely admired anyway. The people who stay in the mutiny, they're just going to be dumb as bricks. I, I Likely. I, I think that's accurate. I do also wonder... Does making these concessions make running the House even more difficult when you already know this is going to be a difficult task because of the narrowness of the Republican majority? Um, you know, does, does McCarthy get the short-term win and a long-term, I don't know if I want to say defeat or loss, but a long-term headache of, you know, does putting these folks on the Rules Committee make it harder to, you know, do you end up having a lot more amendments on bills, do you, you know, do they try to block things that they don't like? You know, there is, you know, an element, the, the, the you know, metaphor of negotiating with terrorists and, and rewarding them. 
Uh, the likes of Dan Crenshaw seem pretty irritated by this. Of like, hey, I've been a loyal guy. I've done what I'm supposed to do. And nobody's making any big concessions to me. You know, there's no yeah, I know the 200 are going to have to be grown-ups. But here's the deal. I think, Jim, what's going to work out here is that McCarthy, is, with the gavel, immediately begins to raise a mountain of money. A mountain of money. Because speakers have the ability to deliver things that other people don't. And that mountain of money grows. And meanwhile, Selena Zito this morning wrote a piece about, uh, uh, who's the guy from Pennsylvania? Um, Perry? Yeah, Scott Perry. He, he, he won by eight points, right? Comfortable. It's fallen apart for him in his district. There are some damning quotes in there. Those mutineers, you know, I just think that once you're in the majority and Jordan's at the border and Gallagher's got the China committee, they're going to come to a debt limit issue in a few months. That will be a difficult one, but it changes immediately once you get the gavel. Doesn't it really? I mean, trouble enough for the day. I don't worry about tomorrow. First things first. I, you know, ordinarily I'd say you're right, Hugh, but I kind of wonder about the, the the values and kind of the incentive structure of the Gateses and Boberts and the most hardcore of that group. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, it doesn't surprise me that Selena Zito talks to people in the district and there are a bunch of folks who are like, is this really getting us what we want? Is this really getting, you know, like we can't do anything until we have a speaker. We can't, you know, can't pass any rules, can't pass any bills, can't uh, hold any oversight hearings, nothing can get done until this gets resolved. And the more you're fighting with each other, the more you're like, you know, the Democrats are just sitting back and eating popcorn and being amused by all this. Uh, you know, what, what are we getting out of this? So it doesn't surprise me. But on the other hand, the next time those voters are going to weigh in on Scott Perry and these other, char- these other characters, it's going to be nearly two years from now. And my guess is between now and November 2024, There'll be a lot of other things on voters' minds between them. So, you know, the, like, Bobert, you know, won by the skin of her teeth. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if Matt Gates fears a primary challenge right now. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 Matt Gates has no future because uh, of well, his problems, because of his uh, past. It, it, okay, like, you know, like, I guess the question is, how does he define his, his future? I guess uh, well, last night I now. raised with Brett Baer, and we talked about, Brett was on this morning, some of these people, are they want to be Trey Gowdy or Jason Chaffetz. They want an, a way out to a, a profitable podcast or a sinecure on a television. And this is exactly the opposite way to go, unless you want to be Alex Jones' co-host, right? Yeah, and maybe yeah, well, they I mean, do. Like, you sure a Newsmax type wouldn't do? No, on? they like, will not touch these people. Okay. I, I'm a veteran of conservative, and there are lines that you cannot, you can be do podcasting, right? But the sort of hard right, the very hard right, uh, area on the podcast world is already occupied. And, you know, people like this, like Vic, you know, Victoria Sparks was a, I think that's her first name. She was a pretty uh, uh, winsome presence on the radio. She bolted Kevin because she wanted to get around on the right flank of Jim Banks for a long shot run at Senate. That's over. I mean, th- I think some consultants are just genuinely stupid, Jim. You know some of them. And they come up with really stupid advice for their members. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, you know, it be, could be the consultants, you. It also could be the members themselves. <laughs> well, with Matt Gates, it is. Yeah. And Bob Good, it is. There are two I know will never come off the island, Gates and Good. Bobert is going to figure out, she's going to, I actually read yesterday, uh, I heard from a former staffer for another Colorado congressman who has had it with her. And they're very conservative Colorado congressperson. Uh, and, and they simply have had it with Boebert. I think she's done. And I, she thought this was a way to, I don't know, rally the troops. It's exactly the wrong thing to have done. And if she wants to stay in Congress, she has to put her nose down and do everything she can to help her colleagues. I, I, okay. I think you're right, Hugh. I hope you're right. Uh, I'm not 100% certain that you're right. Um, look, you know, so I do, yeah, today's morning jolt, I do something almost unprecedented. I quote Molly Jong fast. <laughs> Vanity Fair. Right? And she makes the observation that, like, even though Trump is on the side of McCarthy, that this is the, you know, the ultimate outgrowth of Trump. And seeing Trump come on, you know, be very vocal in support of McCarthy. He, you know, issues a very, you know, very forthright, clear statement, and not a single vote changes. And in fact, Gates kind of, you know, you know uh, tweaks them a little bit, kind of you know, put it on Twitter saying, sad, you know. Um, there is kind of this element of Frankenstein's monster, right? The idea that, like, all of these folks who are from very conservative, very safe, very Trumpy district, with the exception of Boebert, who nearly lost her seat this past cycle, that basically they're like, hey, you know what? Uh, it's, 
uh, it's the Tom Hanks movie about the Somali pirates. Look at me. I am the captain now. Right. Uh, uh, they believe they're in charge. They, they do. They, but last night, one of the 20, good, good source, lost a fundraiser, meaning a fundraiser was canceled last night mm-hmm. by an angry donor who would organize people and invite them to a venue to raise money for one of the 20. You know what? That gets heard in a hurry among the 20. Because these people need money and attention, and they're not going to get any attention. You're not going to see Matt Gates on Fox News. He's going to be in Alex Jones land. And if he wants to live there, fine. It's it, you know he, he could be there forever. But uh, let, let me run down. I, I need to ask you a question. The base. People keep saying the base is with the 20. So I said, let's get a definition. And I want to try a definition off on you, Garrity the Indispensable. You must have voted for Republicans five elections in a row and at least show some activity that demonstrates something beyond voting, a donation of $10, a walked precinct, uh, uh, phone calling, something like that. That's the base. The base is not nuttery. The base is actually regular Republicans. That's the base. Uh, Jim Garrett, I don't think the base is with these 20. What do you think of my definition and what do you think of my calculation? I, I think that's an entirely reasonable definition. I do wonder on it, you know, district to district, and I, I have a bone to pick. I don't, you know, my, my assessment of Molly Jong Fast's piece is not a wholehearted endorsement where she basically says the Republican Party isn't a governing party anymore, that it basically it is now a uh, assembly line for right-wing celebrities. And it's not the whole party. But I think it's now a chunk of the party, and that a chunk of, that chunk of the party is now getting disruptive to the rest of the party, right? The Barrasso's, the Lankfords, the, the you know senators who are there to get stuff done. Right? Not surprising that I didn't read her piece. Did she note that beginning in the morning with Hugh Hewitt, through Dana Loesch in the midday, through Mark Levin in the early evening, through Sean Hannity at night, everyone is with the 200, not the 20? Did she note that? Agree. I, okay, I, I agree with that assessment, and I don't think that was in there. So one of my points is that yeah, it's a chunk of the party. It might be a, it's a plurality. It's a loud plurality, but I don't think it's a majority of the party. But I think it's now a you know, as we can see in this when you only have you know two hundred twenty two House Republicans, even having five maniacs can you know can really yeah, ruin your day. You know, and when, it, yeah, and when you've monetized eccentricity, you've yeah. given them an incentive to be that way. Yeah, and oh by the way. Mainstream media loves to cover the nut jobs. Yes. You hear more about, you know, so in other words, the entire incentive structure is to encourage you to be the biggest nut job you can. And the nut jobs are only all too happy to get that attention because, you know, as much as, much as if somebody made this a very good point in the context of Alex Jones. People would have Alex Jones, and Alex Jones would say, you know, the chemicals are turning the frogs gay. And they would say, no, no, this, we should not be judging the frogs based on their lifestyle. This is entirely their you know, you know, People would like think they're refuting Alex Jones. But by putting Alex Jones on CNN or whatever you know, major platform he's on, 1% of that audience that would never have incur- encountered Alex Jones is like, wow. He's for, finally somebody's made, telling Some, the talking about the frogs. frogs being gay. You're right. You're right. But I do believe that the monetization was badly damaged for the twenty, badly damaged, broken. And when they stood up against Trump and scorned him, I mean, Matt Gates put himself. I mean, he's going to be on the island forever, man without a country, rowing between the boats. He might be invulnerable because his district is dumb as a doenail, and or it's overwhelmingly red, and they. They just don't pay attention. But boy, my goodness. Garrity is followed at Jim Garrity on Twitter. Go to National Review, sign up for the morning jolt, read him in the Washington Post. See him here each week. I'll be right back, America. Stay tuned.